Right, big welcome uh, again to uh, the next in our uh, lecture series uh, of 125 years nursing and education um, celebrations. Um, I'm Liz Westcott and I'm Department Head for Nursing and it uh, gives me great pleasure to also welcome you to Oxford Brooks as well. I'm going to um, talk you through a little bit about what we've been doing in the last um, 18 months. Uh, we set up our working group, in fact nearly two years ago now, uh, and it was made up of uh, Radcliffe um, Guild uh, members, local NHS trust, um, students uh, and alumni, uh, and also um, cross-university um, staff as well. And we are very grateful to secure um, sponsorship funding from Health Education England Thames Valley for the lecture series, uh, and also the uh, Radcliffe Guild, um, and the um, Thames Valley, or the Oxford Academic Health Science Network is going to be sponsoring our last event, which is, uh, we've just had the date, is going to be uh, in the beginning of December, uh, and flyers will be coming out um, to that very soon. So what have we been doing? Uh, if any of you want to tweet, our hashtag is when25nursingoxford. Um, uh, we've had our lecture series, both here and in Swindon, uh, we had uh, a student-organised um, fun run in April at both um, Harcourt Hill and Swindon and raised well over £1,000 for local charities on both sites uh, for that event, which was brilliant. Um, in October, we've got the annual um, civic service in Christchurch Cathedral, uh, and that this year that's going to be dedicated to nursing, and one of our senior lecturers has written an anthem uh, for that event, which our newly formed student nurse choir is going to be singing, uh, which will be brilliant. And on that same day also, we start a two-week uh, run of a, an exhibition in Oxford Town Hall about the history of nursing. And we're very um, grateful that a week ago we heard that we'd secured National Lottery heritage funding um, for that event, which is uh, just brilliant. Um, so we're extremely uh, grateful for that. And. Um, uh, uh, that'll be a, a fantastic um, uh, occasion for people to come and see. So what have we got uh, in the next couple of months? On the 1st of September, we've got Professor uh, Hester Klopper from South Africa, and she'll be doing a lecture here uh, at Marsden Road at about 5 o'clock. Um, 20th of September, we've got Professor Laura Serrant, uh, and again, that lecture will be here at Marsden Road. And then 26th of October, we've got Professor um, Ruth Northway, um, and that again will be at Marsden Road. We've also got two lectures um, in uh, our new campus in Swindon, uh, in the Joel Joff building, um, and the dates for those will be coming out very soon. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping um, uh, reminders before we start. Um, we don't have any um, planned fire alarms going off, and so if you do hear a fire alarm, uh, we'll be uh, escorting you out of the building. Um, and also, if you could put your mobile phones onto silent or onto off, uh, that would be great. Um, there are some very interesting ringtones these days, and uh, I'm sure it would be nice to have them uh, populating um, uh, Trish's um, presentation, but if you could just put them to silent, that would be lovely. Uh, so, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our, our speaker this evening, um, Professor Trish, um, Patricia Davidson from John Hopkins University. Um, and. Um, Trish is um, Council General of the International Council on Women's Health Issues and is a member of the Signa Theta Tau International Institute for Global Healthcare Leadership Advisory Board. Uh, she's a Fellow of the American Academy of Nursing uh, and the American Heart Association and the Preventative Cardiovascular Nurses Association and the Australian College of Nursing. And prior to joining Johns Hopkins University, Professor Davidson was the director of the Centre for Cardiovascular and Chronic Care at the University of Technology in Sydney, uh, and also professor of cardiovascular nursing research at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. So I'm sure you'll agree that she is an extremely well qualified um, nurse to come and speak to us um, this evening, and I'm sure you'd like to join with me in giving um, Patricia Davidson a very warm welcome. So uh, thanks so much, Liz, for that warm welcome. It's fabulous to see my good colleague, Deborah Jackson, here and seeing her thriving and surviving in Oxford. And um, it's a great uh, also to see June here again. And um, I thought this for this uh, my talk, I would talk a little bit about largely about um, women aging, which 
looking around the room is probably uh, of keen interest to us all. If there are a few exceptions. Um, so, as well as talking about really about the feminisation of ageing, which is a very real phenomenon, I thought I'd also talk a little bit about the importance of understanding both sex and gender in healthcare and the importance of that within nursing, midwifery and healthcare. Um, really talk a little bit also about the need for a life course approach to health and wellbeing and also together, um, particularly at your 125th birthday, to collectively strategise about how we can leverage um, policy in both the health and social services agenda to improve health. So, um, happy birthday um, to uh, a wonderful nursing school. And I, when I was preparing my talk to come here, I thought there's very a lot of real similarities between nursing in Oxford and actually nursing at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Um, formal nursing education, as you well know, started in the late 1890s at um, Radcliffe Infirmary. And also nursing education started at Johns Hopkins in 1889 when Johns Hopkins Hospital opened. And for those of you who um, sort of aren't aware of sort of the genesis of Johns Hopkins, so um, this is Johns Hopkins here who um, gave $7 million to, in Baltimore to establish Johns Hopkins University, a um, home for um, orphan children, and also in that gift agreement, the nursing school. So I think the equivalent today of that donation would be something around, you know, $30 billion, but as you can see, it really jettisoned an organisation that is really grounded in the community in which it lives, which is East Baltimore, but also with a global commitment um, for nursing. And of course, in each of our archives, we see the, the wise words of Florence Nightingale, and you really look back on the history of nursing and see how really inspirational she's been. And if you come to Johns Hopkins, we actually have a Florence Nightingale's wheelchair, um, which um, one of the physicians from Hopkins went to, uh, I don't know where he got it from, some, from, I hope he appropriated it by legitimate means, but uh, he, I think he was in London and he brought back Florence's um, a wheelchair. So as I said, really, I'm going to talk a little to you about the feminisation of ageing. And in real terms, this sort of emerged a lot from my practice, um, particularly my area of clinical expertise is in heart failure. And it's really interesting, particularly as I look at my career and where nursing has changed, cardiovascular disease, when I started working in coronary care in the 1980s, was not a disease of women. But now, in particular, heart failure 50% of the population with heart failure are women, predominantly older women, with a very different phenotype of cardiovascular disease, prom you know, more related to hypertension and other conditions rather than specifically coronary artery disease. So we, around the world, uh, the population is aging. And as we can see, across many countries, women um, are expected to to live well into their 80s. And so I actually went back and thinking, you know, what would, a, what would the life expectancy have been when nursing started in the 1880s in Oxford and similarly? So as you can see here, um, women born in the early 1800s in this region could, you know, would be expected to live to age 37. And now if you look at, um, the latest data, you can see that the life expectancy of women in the UK is 83 and increasing. But I'm also later in my presentation going to challenge some of these lifetime pro projections where we can see in particular social determinants of health are seeking to really erode the really important advances we've had in cardiovascular health. And of course, most of the improvements in longevity have come from the management of infectious diseases, and in particular, um, decrease in maternal mortality. 
You know, from the 1800s when um, nursing and midwifery started here in Oxford and many other places, you'd expect four to five deaths per thousand live births. Now we know this is minuscule and when it does occur, it's a real tragedy. But having said that, in the last um, year, the maternal mortality rate in the UK is actually starting to increase. And the reasons for this are healthcare disparities. Firstly, it is um, older women having babies, so increasing the higher risk. But also um, in vitro fertilization and other techniques. But some of the real issues that are setting to erode maternal outcomes are obesity and diabetes. And these are things that are really have changed across our lifespan. So it's interesting, there are some benefits from ageing besides the kilos and the wrinkles, is that you can reflect on where we've come from. And even though now we talk about the burden of non-communicable diseases, which do um, cause the majority of deaths, we have much to celebrate in terms of health care. When I started working in the coronary care unit in the 1980s, people were not admitted if they were over age 60. Can you imagine that? Um, now, the average age in most coronary care units in, and critical care units is you know, late 70s, early 80s. And more importantly, and more significantly, was that you would come on a shift and you would have, it would not be uncommon to have three to four deaths on a shift. And for those of you who are of a similar vintage can likely remember that. And most commonly, there were men dying of heart attacks in their 40s and 50s. And for us that grew up in that period, we also recognised how devastating that was to many families to, to lose their father. So when people talk about we, um, the challenges of ageing and in particular the increasing burden of non diseases, we really have a lot to celebrate largely through the advancement of healthcare, introduction of ma effective management of non-communicable uh, diseases, and also the fact that technological in innovation. What was previously a fatal event of having a heart attack or stroke is no longer the case. But interestingly as well, we are really struggling with this um, the burden of non-communicable diseases and really issues, in particular diabetes and obesity. So I sort of think back to when I was a, a kid at school. If someone had said that you know obesity was to be the challenge of our modern world, you know, I think most of us who were there at that time would have been totally amazed. And part of it is um, this was a lovely quote that I heard from a pediatric. Um, endocrinologist and saying some of the real challenges is how we deal with um, non-communicable diseases is that our ancient genes and modern world have collided. So how we've been pro programmed to survive and thrive is, is a real challenge. That's why in the Lancet last week they said you know that sitting for eight hours a day is you know the next deadly thing to smoking. So many of these things have happened very quickly and we haven't really adapted. Also our science has not always been perfect. You know, the no fat mantra of cardiovascular care of the 60s and 70s is now pe being attributed to this rise in obesity because of you know, focus on carbohydrates um, and so sometimes we just don't get it. But of course, you know, when we look at these rapid epidemiological transitions, we can see that in, particularly in European and North American countries, we have sort of managed to adapt to many of those factors. But in indigenous communities, and in, there are some real challenges, and we see how different markers of cardiovascular disease in, in indigenous communities. And even here in the UK, you know, South Asians have a very different cardiovascular profile than, than many um, other individuals. So it really underscores the importance of thinking about just 
not just um, the clinical entity, but how that fits within a broader socio-cultural and economic context. But having sort of painted that picture of the increasing burden of cardiovascular disease and given you many graphs, this is one of my favourite slides. And it was, it was on the cover of a bulletin, which is an Australian magazine, which is now out of business. And in fact, Olive in this photo shoot, who is from Western Australia, survived the bulletin. But there are so many things about ageing to celebrate. And, you know, as when we look back and thinking when nursing first started in Oxford, there's a lot to celebrate living past 37 years of age. And particularly, I'm very excited to hear that 60 is the new 40, because that's my next birthday. But one of the things that is really important to think about as nurses and midwives and health services planners is you know, how we prepare for this future of ageing. One in three children born today in most developed countries will live to be 100. Now that is pretty phenomenal. The Queen must be so busy these days writing those letters and telegrams. You know, when I was a kid, that was a big deal to turn 100. I mean, I can't think I ever knew of someone turning 100. But this is a very different health and social system that we need to, to look at. And also, as a cardiovascular nurse, I love this slide. And my students groan when they see it. Because also I think, you know, this really creates the picture of what cardiovascular health is. As a heart failure nurse, you spend your life looking at people's ankles. And you see, Olive has had to slip the shoes for the photo shoot. And you look at her ankles and you think, you know, she's probably got two or three of edema. But is that venous congestion? Is it heart failure? How are you going to manage and treat Olive at 140? 104 years of age. And one thing that I've learned over my career is just because you can do something doesn't mean you have to do something. So you can actually think of if, if Olive presented at an emergency department, what are you going to do? Is she going to have a, a, a cardiac catheterization? Are they going to whiz her off to the cath lab? Is her coronary artery disease this, you know, macrovascular disease or microvascular disease. So in lots of ways, this is a very new phenomenon. And in fact, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, which is the most common form of heart failure, and anyone here who has a, a mother over aged 85 or, or mother-in-law or aunt is likely to have this condition. And yet we really don't know how to treat it. So that's edema, shortness of breath, those factors. And because it's new, we just, this is really a new phenomenon of, of um, ageing. So, also as a nurse in cardiovascular disease, I've done a lot of work in terms of advocating for women in cardiovascular disease. So, but if I go and talk to, if I was giving this talk at the John Radcliffe, they would probably say, but women live longer than men. Like, okay, that's all that matters, that women live longer than men. And sure, women li do live longer than men, but often with significant disability. And we have not yet, as, um, as health professionals, geared up the system to really helping women and men live longer, satisfying lives. So I just drew some data from the United Kingdom. So just to give you a flavour for uh, many of the in clinical encounters you have, and I'm sure for those of you in practice, these are very familiar stories. So in the United Kingdom, um, uh, there's over 3.5 million people who are age 65 live alone. And 36% of the people aged 65 and above, nearly 70% of these are women. 61% of wid widows, both male and female, in, the, in um, England and Wales are aged 75 years and older. Carers UK estimate that 58% of all carers of all ages are women. 
And I'm sure around in this room there would be many carers. Just really luck out if your uh, daughter-in-law or daughter or close friend is a nurse. And but yet when we look at the socio-cultural context and really the poverty associated with ageing is that many people, uh, you know, when just last year when surveyed in the United Kingdom, one third of people aged 60 and over were actually worried about being able to pay their, for the heating of their homes in the winter. And we know that every year there are uh, deaths, multiple deaths, due to just inadequate heating. So basically, our health and social services were never really geared for us to live this long. You know, we were all supposed to retire at age 65, maybe have a one or two cruises and then die. <laughs> That's kind of the reality. That's the way health and social services were set up. They weren't geared to think that we would be living with multiple chronic conditions for a long period of time. And it's really up to us as nurses and healthcare providers to see how we gear our, not just our sickness care, but our health care and social care to really meet the needs of people living with chronic conditions. So this is a problem for both men and women. And women's health is not a competition against men. Equally, women and cardiovascular disease is not a competition against women with cancer. It's just to say that these different entities have different things that we need to consider. And often, sex and gender are used interchangeably, like they both mean the same thing. And in some journals, yes, they do mean the same things. People describe sex as gender. But in real terms, there is a difference, and we really need to start thinking about these the difference, particularly within a life course approach to illness and disease. Um, about it? So sex refers to biological and physiological characteristics that are very, very real. And gender refers to behavior roles, expectations, and activities in society. So women and cardiovascular disease, women and hypertension, women and diabetes do not necessarily equate to the same form of management as men's conditions. So we really need to think about that. And as well as these physiological differences, which do make a difference in cardiovascular disease, um, it's interesting as you look at women, women's health. When uh, my husband uh, was a severe asthmatic as a child, and of course then at that, he was, that was described to being a nervous condition, an anxious child. Um, whereas we know that asthma is clearly an immunological condition. Similarly, women and cardiovascular disease around the perimenopause where it's a highly vas uh, vascular, vasoactive phenomena. How many women who have had coronary artery spasm have been sent home on antidepressants because they're just not coping well at life? But yet we now know that there's truly a vasoactive microvascular disease that occurs in the, around the menopause. So these are messages to us that we just cannot be entirely always sure about our science. That we have to accept that knowledge changes and evolves over time. But what is probably more important to consider, and something that we as nurses really have a power to change, is looking at the social factors that impair women's outcomes. So we know that there are unequal power relationships between men that social norms decrease education and paid employment opportunities. There is almost, particularly within the global health environment, a very strong emphasis on women's reproductive roles. And from a critical social theory perspective, you know, in, a, in essence, women, older women are invisible in the 
global health discourse. Because society cares about our ability to reproduce and mother. And also we know across many conditions that women are much more vulnerable to physical and sexual violence. And we know this happens in the girl, girl child and in adolescence, but it is still a, also a real phenomena in older women. Now, we've come a long way in terms of gender equity and women's role and participation in society. We have come a long way, come a huge way from our, our mothers. And when I arrived in London and I went for a work, walk around Hyde Park, you know, I took a photo of Emily Pankhurst because I thought, boy, we, there are some amazing women that have done some really heavy lifts. But this was a photo taken in 2014 on a flight from Sydney to Melbourne at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning. And you know, sometimes you have those moments and you think, oh my goodness. So, of course, I'm at the back of the plane. And with all due respect, I was there with one of my female, with one of my male cardiologist colleagues. We were going to Melbourne for the day. But this is what a business flight looks like between Sydney and Melbourne on a Monday morning. Where are the women? And if anybody really wants to see just the huge misogyny, and if anybody thinks that gender doesn't matter at all in this world, just turn on the TV and watch the US election. Gender is alive and well. People talk about their wives as good looking, as not about smart and intelligent. And then Hillary, who, whenever I'm having a bad day, I think about Hillary Clinton. I'm serious. I think, how do you get up every day and just face this inexorable barrage of criticism about so, yeah, maybe the emails, she made a mistake, but um, this was after her speech. Hillary accepts nomination, immediately bores Americans into a coma before start startling them awake with her capital. So there are very always critical comments about women leaders. And you might think, you know, how, how does this matter? Why is this important for us to consider? Well, firstly, nursing as a highly feminized workforce. We cannot say that gender doesn't matter. We have to think about these factors. And also, as being advocates for patients and their families, really champion issues of gender and equality in healthcare delivery. So many of us who have been engaged in women's health for a long period of time, um, have been really excited since 2011. Really, nurse, and I think this is important within the gender discussion. For probably, there was, I think about it as the dark ages of women's health, where we went from everybody being equal and not thinking about specific gender concerns. And it really emerged again in the UN agenda in 2011 about when women, which was really established as a vehicle for in a gender equality and the empowerment of women. It was basically looking around the world, societies were being de are still being decimated because of violence against women, about women not have, being able to go to school and also just being marginalised in society. And just by sheer good luck, we've been born in countries where that is not an issue. But we can't think that we live in a globalised world and that does not matter to us, to you in the UK, in the US or Australia. We, na we across the world, we are seeing these human rights abuses that do not know the boundaries of countries and are creeping into our life in very real and meaningful ways. So Michelle Bachelet, who is now the um, president of Chile, um, 
talks about gender equality becoming a, a lived reality. So I've talked a little bit about the socio-cultural and gender aspects of being a woman. We know that even living in the UK, the US or Australia, where we have a right to education, where we vote, where we can meaningfully participate in society, is still not a level playing field. But also now I want to, you to think a little bit about the sex-based differences and the importance of our role as nurse scientists and as clinicians to think about how we really engage women in research. So as you can see, you know, really up until 10 years ago, the, the data for women and cardiovascular disease was just, in particular, all women's health conditions was just a black hole. There was just no rigorous research. And we've all seen sort of the, how the HRT issue kind of got carried away, thinking, well, look, yes, if we can just give women back those estrogens, everything will, will go away. But this has really changed. And across many research entities, in particular the National Institutes of Health in the US, which started off the Office of Women's Health, now it's very hard to get any study funded unless it constitutes the representation of the society in which you want to improve people. So this just does not speak about um, women or gender or male or female. It also, also means uh, we need to consider ethnic distributions as well. So as I mentioned, um, there's been a lot of advocacy about women and cardiovascular disease. And so why is this important? Firstly, we need women to be aware that um, cardiovascular disease is an issue. And, it, when, uh, and my area of focus is cardiovascular disease, but whether you're working in respiratory or oncology, etc., good cardiovascular health refers to a set of core behaviours which are good for everything. So, and as they say, if exercise was a tablet, a medication, be the most prescribed um, medication. But this is why it's important. Because, yes, we're going to live longer, but the chances of living longer and having a serious chronic illness are very high unless we engage in preventive behaviours. So, as we know, that's just not as easy to say uh, that we should exercise, we should eat. And in fact, Deborah will tell you, I'm a victim myself. This morning I was going to get, I was going to go for a walk, but life took over. But part of it is that I think women, we're not trained or socialised to place our own health as a priority. We're, you know, if it was my child that needed anything, or even my friend or whatever, I would do that. Um, we, in particular, don't think that heart disease is a woman's disease, think that it's a man's disease. And we know that we have all these stereotypes of the Hollywood heart attack of a man clutching his chest and falling to the floor. But that's not really how very many heart attacks occur. Well, sometimes also we don't think we're old enough to be at risk, feel too busy to make changes in our lives, and also public health messages and the media emphasise reproductive health. And there is not a valuing of older women. It's a, there is, you know, women, as they become older, become invisible in the discourse and invisible in the media. I was on the board of the Heart Foundation and in Australia, and they kept, every time there was a heart week, they wanted me to send them a photo of a patient. They never liked any of the photos of the patients I sent. And you'll see some of them later, because they were women, like me, not you know, the, the um, marathon runner who has a heart attack, which is, the pathology is totally different to coronary artery disease, but that's what. So there's a, a woman, Noel Berry Mertz, who's a phenomenal cardiologist, and she actually he heads up the um, Yentl Centre, funded for, by Barbara Streisand, 
um, at UCLA. And she talks about, you know, what are the explanations for the disparities in women's cardiovascular health and why ageing does not necessarily mean good health. So she talks about these things of blame the victim. You know, people say, well, women have minor symptoms and they don't come for, you know, or delay seeking attention. You know, there is a lot of ageism. Women are, all, are, are older and not as aggressively treated, and so there is real health disparities in the way between men and women are treated. Um, there is, you know, overt sexism, whether it's implicit or implicit bias. We know that often the implicit biases can be just as powerful as, as things that we recognise. People say, well, women are, not, are, are less likely to have or die from coronary heart diseases. And also, increasingly, as we understand more the sexual aspects of coronary artery disease or the sex-based differences, we recognise that women have a different pattern to men in manifestation of cardiovascular disease. And so this, these are very important things to think about. I also now want to move back to thinking about social aspects of women ageing. I've identified that there are inherent gender disparity issues, that there are also um, sex-based differences. But as women age, there are also factors that mediate health outcomes. And one of the big issues is widowhood or living alone. And you know, just in the contemporary discourse, we talk about widowhood because of women losing a partner. This is a very real phenomenon. So economically, it's a big issue. So if, if your partner dies, male or female, and you're living in a house, you've still got to pay the same rent, the electricity bill still costs the same, the gas still costs the same, you still costs the same to do many activities. So we know that there's a real economic factor as to why women in particular don't bear as well at the end of life. Women have commonly had significant gaps in their careers, have not compounded enough superannuation. They have or engaged in work that has not accrued benefits. So to start with, women are disadvantaged economically. And we now, in the, one of the most disadvantaged groups in the United States are women who have been divorced, who are older, who have no home, no insurance, many of those factors. But also I think the other important thing to think about is the impact of loneliness and social isolation on health outcomes. And any of us who have done home-based care just recognise you know, how isolated some And also, interestingly, how, for many older women, how their life becomes so women-centric. They crave actually seeing a man. I remember on, you know, edu um, working with a, a male a clinical nurse specialist, and this one woman I was seeing is 96, she was gorgeous. She said, don't you come next time. I said, what do you mean? She said, send the young man. And I don't know whether it's because he changed the light bulb or et cetera, but also I thought often their lives become so female-centric. Everybody that they see is a woman. And I thought, oh, it's just interesting. But we know that loneliness and isolation are associated with adverse health outcomes. And interestingly, this is again UK data. In 2016, over a third of older people considered the television as their primary form of company. It's, it's kind of a chastening thought in a civil society where we have so much, but in other ways we have so little. And there's a, an Australian researcher, who, Bob Cummings, who has done this really uh, he, happiness index and 
quality of life. And he kind of basically says above 70 or 1,000 Australian dollars, it doesn't really matter that much. So you're not happier or not. So in essence, sometimes, particularly as you get older, you don't need a whole lot more to be happy. But, you know, company and social interaction is a big thing. And I think we need to think about these as how we develop models of care and models of intervention for older people. So another area of work where I've done a lot of um, research is cardiac rehabilitation. And people say, yes, you can do home-based cardiac rehabilitation and that works just as well. Well, it probably does from a physiological perspective, but in terms of the psychodynamic support and just getting people out and about, um, that's really so I think when we look at older people, either men or women, and across any clinical condition, whether you're working in rheumatology, diabetes, oncology, aged care, if you look across a whole range of health conditions, these are the predictors of adverse outcomes. Social isolation, socioeconomic disadvantage, depression, and marginalization. And really for nurses, this is our core business. This is where we really shine. And this is why it's never been a better time to be a nurse. Because we know that you know, the pill will only work if the person takes it. And so how we configure healthcare to meet these needs is really important. <laughs> I'd skip that. So the other thing that I think is really important, particularly when we, we talk about health outcomes. I've worked in many facilities where, academic health centres, where I think it's easier to get a stem cell, a stem cell transplant than a legible discharge summary, and I mean that seriously. Because in academic health centres, we're always looking for the amazing whiz-bang thing. So when you go to Grand Rounds, who wants to hear about everyday heart failure. They wanted to hear about Takasubo syndrome, the weird and the wonderful. They want to know, you know, what um, you know gene has been mapped. They want the magic cure, the you know, the magic bullet. But when you look across a whole lot of healthcare entities, you know, poverty, access to care, environmental exposure and racism, all of those factors are really the moderators of adverse health outcomes. To the state, now, again, I've tried to weave some historical perspectives through the talk, even my own historical perspectives of being a cardiovascular nurse. So in the 70s or 80s, if I wrote in any of my papers that stress or anxiety or socioeconomic status were uh, a you know, predictor of adverse health outcomes in cardiovascular disease, I would have got an F. But just this last year, the American Heart Association put out this position statement on social determinants of risk and outcomes for cardiovascular disease. And what this position paper says, that for the first time in history, there's the potential that the next generation will not outlive their parents. And that's largely related to social factors, to obesity, or not social factors, but clinical entities derived from, from social factors. Obesity, diabetes, depression, marginalization, alienation. And that's pretty chastening from, a, to, from the American Heart Association, from a country that has really spearheaded a lot of work in cardiovascular disease. So here are the women that I take care of. These are, these are the women that the Heart Foundation didn't really want in their glossy brochures because they were women from Blacktown, Mount Druitt, in the outer western suburbs of Sydney, and where we developed a women-specific cardiac rehabilitation program. So really tailoring cardiac rehabilitation specific to gender-based issues. <clears throat> because in, in the best centres, and I'd be interested at the Radcliffe, in the best centres, you know, 10 to 20% of eligible women attend cardiac rehabilitation. 
And the reasons are transportation, have a low self-efficacy for exercise. They don't feel confident about their bodies or their body shape. They are worried about continence. And they don't just prioritise their health care. So we just can't necessarily think of the same solution. Also, when we evaluated these programs, one of the women, which to this day I will still remember it, wrote in her evaluation, my life began when I had a heart attack because she had been living in this very socially isolated, abusive relationship. And it was through getting you know, transport support, which is kind of minuscule in the amount of money we spend in healthcare, to bring these women together in a collective opportunity for social psychodynamic support. So this is one of my favourite quotes, and this is Loetija O'Donoghue, who is an Australian nurse. And in Australia, we have what are called living legends. And she is an Aboriginal nurse. And in 2003, I went to one of her talks. And she, you know, one of, we know that Aboriginal Australians live 20 years less than uh, white Australians, which is similar across many other um, indigenous populations, including Maori. And of course, everybody wants to look for this you know, elusive magic bullet that's going to change things. But Lloyd had just said, socially created problems can likely be socially transformed. So if we look at all these factors that we know contribute to adverse health outcomes, physical inactivity, depression, alienation, marginalisation, as nurses and midwives, we've really got huge power to change that. We've got huge power to develop interventions that are tailored and targeted to particular populations. And also we've got a, the capacity to change the healthcare system to be welcoming and engaging and embracing of any. And I can tell you after nearly 40 years of being a nurse, hospitals have not changed that much. There's a few more bells and whistles, but structurally, they pr feel pretty much the same. And we can put person-centred in our mission statements as much as we like. But if you're in hospital, aren't you with a loved one? Aren't you just so glad that you're a nurse? Aren't you just so glad that you know the system? Aren't you just so glad that you can help people navigate? So you think for people, for the vast majority of the population, healthcare is alienating, difficult to na na navigate, very challenging. I just sort of wanted to finish off by talking a little bit about how we approach issues of equity. And I don't want you to leave this lecture theatre today thinking that ageing as a woman is not a good thing. We're all in there for ageing. But hopefully I've got you to think a little bit about, unless we address some downstream inequities, we are really going to truly potentiate adverse health outcomes. This is a model from Lisa Cooper, who is a phenomenal African-American cardiologist at Johns Hopkins. And she has this great way of, of looking at things, which I think can be really helpful. So you know, this is disparity. So we know there is gender disparity. We know for many racial groups there is disparities. And many ethnic groups. This is equality. People say, well, women get the same care as men. As, uh, as men. People say, you know, people with disabilities get the same care. That African American people get the same care. This is equality. But equity is where we really tailor and target interventions to specific needs that are based in social determinants of health. And so I've just really given you a snapshot, a case study of women who are ageing. But can I tell you that probably we can see from the antenatal clinic the women who are not going to age well and the women who are not going to reach their life's potential. Because we know that the 
postcode in which we are born, our parents are going to moderate our life's destiny. So as nurses and midwives, we, can, we have the power to, to moderate that destiny. That can be through really looking at opportunistic interventions. And probably if you really want to change cardiovascular health, you want to change health, improve diabetes, probably the time to invest is in maternal and child health unit, not necessarily you know, when someone is 80 years of age with significant um, disability. So just in conclusion, you know, health and well-being is, is moderated by the environment and there are clear social gradients in health. The longevity achieved by women, and we can debate why that, that few years <laughs> is an advantage, but living longer does not mean that people are not living with disability. We know that poorer people live shorter lives and have more disability. That health equity and human rights and distribution of power moderate health outcomes and often older women, particularly those from ethnic and minority groups, are the most disempowered. And I think really we are entering an era of what is called multimorbidity. That you know, even people talked about communicable and non-communicable diseases. But even now as a nomenclature, that does not fit. HIV AIDS is now a chronic illness. Cancer is now a chronic illness. So how are we going to configure systems to manage this multimorbidity? Now I would argue that nursing is intrinsically geared towards caring for people with multimorbidity. Because we are not about, we don't see a patient come into clinic and say, sorry, no, I'm you've got to go to respiratory, you've got to go to diabetes. You sit down with the patient, and you look at their list of problems, and you help them work it out and coordinate it. Doesn't mean you don't reach out to, to your colleague, but intrinsically nursing is a holistic perspective to patient care. So I think we are uniquely poised to meet these global health challenges. But as well as thinking about the clinical dimensions of care, unless we address the social determinants of health care, we're not going to afford um, health outcomes. So I've used the scenario of older women as, an, as to me an example of how we have to think beyond just the physical, to think about the social, economical and also political dimensions of health. And we know that gender disparities are evident, it's interesting, at the beginning of life they're most evident, in the midlife they disappear a little bit, but where they're most pronounced is at the end, at older dimensions of life. So thank you very much. <laughs>